Uh, Dr. Haas, who would you say was the most influential advisor to President Bush, 43? It's a great question. Uh, my cop-out answer is himself. Uh, hi, my name is Stuart Ham with a group called We Are Change LA. First, thank you for being here and talking so candidly, giving us some insight into Oval Office discussions. It's not something you get every day. But uh, you differentiate between wars of necessity, wars of choice. Uh, I'm sure you're familiar with the Project for New American Century if you weren't involved personally. Isn't it true that fundamentally these were wars of agenda? And isn't there actually an agenda uh, driving us under the guise of this or that for, for, for empire, for, uh, you know, you put it as spreading democracy when we're actually a constitutional republic and our constitution is being dismantled in this process. It's very alarming to a lot of us. I'm hoping you could speak to that. Thank you. Well, I find the wars, again, fundamentally different. The first war, and what in general, wars of necessity, as I said, are where you have vital interests and where you don't have alternatives. In this case, it was really for, for fundamental reasons of regional and global order. I'm comfortable with that as a foreign policy goal. I would not want to live in a world in which either a tyrant like Saddam Hussein controlled the majority of the world's oil, or where international relations was conducted, uh, how would I put it, absent the principle that states should not use force as a matter of course against other states. It's indeed the basic, the most fundamental concept of international relations of the last 350, 400 years is just that, that sovereignty ought to be respected for the most part. I'm not arguing that they deliberately f fostered the attack in order to have an excuse. I think that's too paranoid. Uh, well, I certainly agree with your comment that that would be too paranoid. Uh, <laughs> there's zero evidence, I believe, that people missed 9-11 because of uh, preoccupation with Iraq. The 9-11 uh, Commission, which I thought was one of the more creative and talented commissions that ever produced a report, never saw that. And I never picked up an inkling of it. That said, I, I know what Paul O'Neill said, and it's true to some in the sense that there were people who from the get-go had an agenda about Iraq. I, I didn't sense it was high up on the president's list early on, and it's one of those counter-historicals. Had 9-11 not happened, would the Iraq war have uh, happened or not? I don't know the answer to that. Uh, I think the odds are against it, but I wouldn't rule it out. Uh, I would simply say what, what's clear to me is that 9-11 totally changed the political and more important psychological context. And that's where I said at one point I described the, the administration as a hammer looking for a nail after 9-11, and Iraq became the proverbial nail. They were looking for a vehicle to make a statement, and Iraq was the, the vehicle to do just that. And so even had 9-11 that had not been sure there would have been advocates for going to war against Iraq, and for all I know, Iraq would have given us provocations or whatever. Uh, but 9-11 certainly made it far, I mean, obviously, it, it brought it about, and it made it, it brought it about much sooner. And so I really do think it, it changed fundamentally the debate. Dr. Haas, question all the way to your left here. Hi, my name is Alex from Hollywood. I uh, just had a question. How do you feel the military industrial complex played into both Iraq wars? <laughs> I don't believe there are are things like the military industrial complex that forced decision making. The first war, people weren't looking for a war in 1990. It, what I called the war of necessity was a very close run thing. And that was even after the UN had voted in support of it. Still then, it barely passed the Senate by more than a handful of votes. So I didn't see any, there was no powerful military industrial complex lobbying for that war. The uh, second war, again, it was uh, not because of lobbying. It was because, I believe, uh, of the ideas of a group of individuals. I actually think that history will look back at the Second Iraq War in some ways that it looks at the Spanish-American War.
as a, a war that to some extent was brought about by policy entrepreneurship on the part of individuals who had a, a certain agenda. So it was not to enrich or strengthen a military industrial complex, but it was to basically promote a set of objectives of the United States in the world. Again, uh, coming back to where I began, I think what really makes history are people and ideas. Uh, so it's not the, with all due respect to Mr. Eisenhower, it wasn't the military industrial complex. I guess uh, you've said two things here tonight that are surprising to me. Uh, the first is that... Uh, is that history... a compliment or a criticism? Uh, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, uh, the first is that history is, in, uh, in, is not inevitable. And the second is that you do not believe that the military industrial complex exists or is influential on how we you know, um, go about our business. Um, and the reason those are surprising to me is because when you have people such as Dick Cheney, Paul Wolfowitz, um, the Bush family, uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, royal family, are involved in both the first Iraq war and the second Iraq war, um, Certainly, there's things that they wanted to accomplish the first time that didn't happen. You come in, bring in uh, troops, make a whole lot of money for the same people who didn't get what they wanted to accomplish the first time done. In turn, as far as I'm concerned, the military industrial complex is alive and well in America. And um, history is certainly, uh, is, is history is absolutely inevitable because there was just a matter of time before this happened again. Case in point, you could also say Afghanistan. No one has ever conquered Afghanistan, so history should teach us the inevitable result is that we will be destroyed and we will lose an unnecessarily um, large number of troops. So I guess my question is, um, how could you, how could you um, say that history is not inevitable <laughs> and that the military industrial complex does not exist? Let me uh, take the second one first. On the military industrial complex, I didn't say it doesn't exist. I was asked whether in any way I thought it led to either of these conflicts. The answer is no. I think there's powerful lobbying forces. And when you look at the defense budget debate, I think I or anyone would be naive to say there's no you know, uh, push out there for certain weapon systems and so forth. And I think our defense budget is, let me put it this way, the defense budget we have is not the defense budget I know anyone would design. It's certainly not the one the Secretary of Defense would design. And that's because of um, lobbying forces and so forth. It's, it's because of uh, corporations. It's also because of the way our, our politics in this country is funded. And weapon systems which are built in you know, 48 states or something like uh, that. So that's simply, to me, a fact of life. It's not unique, by the way, to the defense business. American public policy of all sorts is to a large extent determined by, or shaped, the term is too strong of a word, I apologize, but is shaped by various special interest groups that have narrow interests. It's not bad, it's just the way it is. And foreign policy and defense policy in that sense are, are reflective of that larger uh, phenomenon. And you may be right in your reading of Afghanistan, I don't know. Uh, but I would simply say it's, it's one of the first big foreign policy decisions of the administration. And I would call it a war of choice because it's not essential. And uh, the United States had other policy options, including keeping lesser goals, just going after Al Qaeda. But we've chosen to go out to uh, pursue slightly more lofty objectives in Afghanistan, not as a, not as lofty as they could be. I have one question. Sure. You were, you you praise the 911 Commission, and I'm wondering how you could praise it when they didn't even mention Building Seven. Uh, I don't know the details of Building 7, so I can't help you, sir. Sorry. Just Google it. I will. 